everything, there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heavens. And springtime is the season of new life. And we must bear in mind that there are three kinds of life. First, there is the life of the soil. Last year's leaves, decaying vegetation and all that we may think of dead, is really very much alive as the earth is constantly replenished. Secondly, healthy Mother Earth gives birth to and supports all things that grow, but which are rooted to one spot. And crowning the Trinity, up from Mother Earth, through the infinite variety of plants, there is the magnificent life that is not tied down, but is free to swim and run and fly. And in the proper season, new life bursts out of its cocoons, its wombs, its shells, to taste and feel and see the spring-washed world into which they have come. And the parents of all these young things have no doubts about where they belong in the grand symphony of nature's scheme of life. And they have no doubts about how to take care of their young, but the best that nature has provided. They cannot read or write, but they know what food is intended for them. Exercise is alternated with rest. Cradled in warmth and shelter, peace and quiet and loving care, the young follow the lead of their parents and are guided safely and surely on the road to health and happiness. Hello, what have we here? Obviously a representative of the human race. Man behaves as if he were master of all creation with the power to dominate all other animals. And the paradox is that of all the living creatures of the world, the only one who is in doubt about his place in nature and how to take care of his young is 20th century man. Mankind was given a Garden of Eden with his pathway through life garlanded with the ineffable blessing of peace and good health. But he has distorted it into a maelstrom of confusion with premature death and disease rampant everywhere. He has strayed far from nature and his simple natural needs. And by his unlawful living habits he is destroying himself. He is sick in body, distorted in his mind, and tortured in his soul. His whole existence on earth is a nightmare of constant threats of disease and terrifying danger to his life, all the way from the cradle to the grave. And when death has struck its final bell, how futile are the words of the poet, turn backward, turn backward, O time in thy flight, make me a child again just for tonight. For civilization hurtles on its heedless way, while many a lonely heart grieves for a soul too soon departed from this earth. And even more sorrowful than those who suffer and die too soon is the story of those countless unborn children who have never gladdened the hearts of childless parents. Have you ever thought what a sad place the world would be if there were no children in it? I had been at Sheldon and Rose's wedding when they were married ten years ago. They were making the best of the fact that they could not have a child of their own. They had constantly tried every kind of treatment that was recommended, but it seemed to be hopeless. It was small comfort to them to know that 10% of all married couples in the United States are sterile. I used to give them magazine articles and books and ask questions like, did you know that with all living creatures, the maintenance of health and perpetuation of the species is an important law of nature and that good health and procreation may go hand in hand? And Sheldon, who was more of the physical type, began to read and think. Here I am, only 35 years old, getting up with a taste in my mouth like the wrath of the gods. My hair is thinning out. My sight isn't what it used to be. I'm about 60 pounds overweight. I have a bad case of colitis. My psoriasis itches like the devil. No matter what toothpaste I use, I still get cavities. And I'm always tired. 
Like most Americans, Sheldon and Rose always started their day with a whopping breakfast. Like most Americans, they knew that coffee contains poison, which didn't stop them from drinking it. But they had not known, for example, that in his book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, Weston Price, after exhaustive research all over the world, proves that highly refined and concentrated white flour and white sugar products fed to primitive peoples not only ruined their teeth, but ruined their health, physically, mentally, and spiritually in the space of a single generation. Like most other civilized people, they were always in a hurry, and the kind of foodless foods which they ate during the day and for their evening meal were the typical factory products which had been refined, canned, frozen, pickled, bottled, salted, fried, boiled, baked, or cooked to death. Their neighbors and their relatives' children liked to come to their home because they made such a fuss over them. They called them Aunt Rose and Uncle Shelley. But what they wanted to hear more than anything else in the world was their own child calling them Dad and Mommy. They tried to fill their lives with other interests. Plato had a regular gymnasium. He ate only the kind of food that was recommended for parakeets. They guarded his health carefully, and despite the fact that he had to live under artificial conditions, just like his masters, he was in tip-top shape. The only trouble was that Sheldon bought so many toys for him that Rose said he would become a spoiled brat. But a home without children can be a lonesome place. And there was much love lavished on this cocky little fellow. In the case of their pets, they understood that strength and beauty come from within. But with themselves, they were always trying to use a magic pill or a mysterious concoction that would rub it in from the outside. Of course, they were always up late to watch TV. And as any television addict knows, the after midnight shows are usually a series of endless commercials with old movies sandwiched in between. Television is the most powerful medium for reaching the mind of man. What a blessing it would be if more people could see the facts which we presented to Rose and Sheldon. Here in these burning leaves, we see the folly of civilization's destruction of nature's method of restoring the Earth's fertility. The result is a low grade of food and the ashes of disease and death. Having destroyed the natural immunity to disease, which comes from a well-nourished soil, man spreads deadly poisons on almost all his food. Nature strives constantly towards perfection, and here, too, she uses insects to abort inferior products. Man thinks that he has spoiled nature's effort to protect him. However, as he kills the insects, he endangers his own health and, indeed, his very life. Yalmar Stephenson, the great protagonist of meat-eating, states in his book, Not By Bread Alone, that man is not by nature a meat-eater. In addition to breaking this natural law, he has perverted the taste of his children, and today he eats incredible things in abominable combinations. In their book, The Newer Knowledge of Nutrition, McCollum and Simmons state that modern civilization is carrying on an experiment of endeavoring to live on a diet such as has never been tried before in man's history. Man is his own guinea pig, and this experiment is taking place in the vast laboratory of life itself. Man overeats, overworks, gets insufficient rest, drives himself to the brink of exhaustion, then stimulates himself back to activity with a thousand remedies. He drinks poisonous liquor and depends upon smoking tobacco as an escape from the miseries of his body, mind, and soul. But his narcotic bliss is disturbed because it has been suggested that cigarette smoking may be a cause of lung cancer. As if it were not common knowledge, as Jesse Mercer Gaham points out in his book, Smoke Over America, that tobacco in any form is injurious to the stomach, liver, pancreas, lungs, intestinal tract, and the eyes. That it has a deleterious effect on fertility, longevity, and beauty. 
However, filter tips are suggested as an answer to the cancer scare, and things soon return to normal insanity. Man's magnificent brain accepts this fantastic claim, and now his only worry is which filter tip to smoke. Very funny, perhaps, but it is no laughing matter. Supposing that you were told that you had cancer of the lung and that one half of your lung would have to be cut out, would you reach for another filter tip cigarette? We're not talking about some other John or Jane, but we mean you, Y-O-U. Statistics show that the hand of disease and death may be pointing right at you and may claim you for the next victim. Will you be the one out of every four persons now alive who will develop cancer? Ten million Americans are suffering from heart and circulatory diseases. Will you be one of them? Are you the one out of every 12 persons who will spend some part of your life in a mental hospital? Are you one of the 10% who will have ulcers? Two million of us have diabetes and half of us don't know it. Are you one of those who will be caught? Whatever your station in life, you may be next on the list. 90% of all persons beyond middle age in this country will have some form of arthritis, the nation's greatest crippler. And in the case of children, chronic diseases like cerebral palsy, epilepsy, muscular dystrophy, and multiple sclerosis are widespread. Gordon Brand, a cystic fibrosis victim, is but one example of thousands of children who cry out for help. Is there no escape? Is it man's destiny to be sick? Sheldon and Rose were learning the answer to these questions. Is it possible that the tree of life is governed by the law of as ye sow, so shall you reap? And if the roots of our lives are poison habits, disturbed emotions, constant excesses on the one hand, and serious deficiencies on the other, the result is enervation and general toxemia? Is it a fact that chronic disease evolves only after the suppression of many acute crises? while the real cause, our unnatural habits, is never removed? Is it possible that we build disease beginning with birth? Is it possible that by correctly providing a baby's simple needs for a safe journey through life, we can build health instead of disease? Instead of mere theory, Sheldon and Rose learned about many actual people who have mastered the art of intelligent living. People like Joanna Lange of St. Louis, Missouri, who, besides having a master's degree in music, has two fine children who have never had any of the so-called childhood diseases. And she attributes it to the fact that she depends upon the resources of nature for their health. People like Althea Pennepen of Batavia, New York, a real mother who knows that human babies, like their animal friends, are entitled to the only food that is intended for them in the beginning, their own mother's milk. People like Ralph and Alice Schneider of Brighton Beach, New York, who have good reason to be happy. You may recognize their lucky daughter, Diana. And Diana and her older sister, Ronnie, are lucky because they're being raised normally. And by normally, we mean having a breakfast of fresh fruit. And by normally, we mean getting the best of air, sunshine, exercise, and rest that it is possible to provide. And by normally, we mean absolute freedom from chronic disease or fear of disease. Whole fresh fruit and vegetables, mostly uncooked, constitute the staples of their diet. They drink milk as animals do, only during the nursing period of life. And it is raw and unpasteurized. They eat no meat, nor salt, nor spices. Healthy appetite needs no seasoning. In Bloomfield, New Jersey, we visited the family of John and Adele Sefcik. It was Christmas, the season of peace and goodwill, when the innate love which is normal to mankind runs to high and noble conscious expression. And John and Adele are among the fortunate parents who realize that love for their children means protecting and guarding them from... <laughs> Little Mark fell asleep, but Richard had a lunch of freshly made carrot juice a salad chopped up on the blender. He also likes to eat it whole. 
and unroasted, unsalted peanut butter. No sugar and no spice, and other things not so nice, for they're not the things that healthy little boys are made of. And while we were in New Jersey, we dropped in on the Campbell family at Packernack Lake. Five of them, three boys and two girls. And after a brisk morning on the ice, with a the thermometer hovering around zero, you may be thinking that they'll be coming in for a hot lunch of meat and potatoes and pie. Let's see. While she prepared lunch, and kindly observed that she washes the fruit thoroughly, we asked Sophie Campbell, do your children stay healthy and happy on a diet of fresh fruit, nuts, salads, and some cooked vegetables? And she replied, they certainly do. And on the rare occasions when one of them may have a sniffle or any other slight indisposition, we know that it is nature's way of cleansing the body. And Papa Campbell agreed and added that a few days without food and rest in bed if possible, and their youngsters would bounce up just for raring to go. He added that nothing serious can ever happen to children who live as closely as possible in accordance with nature's law. Health cannot be bought. It must be built, just like the well-planned airplane that flew us westward to meet Dr. and Mrs. Ted Franklin of Bryan, Texas who are following the same pattern of normal living and add to the skein of evidence that good health is not an accident. He is interested in pre-culture and she, well, let's quote her. I have my books and my religious study. I have many other interests, but above all, I would like the whole world to benefit from the knowledge of how successful we have been in imparting good health, physically, mentally, and spiritually to our children. And these glowing youngsters remind us of a bouquet of American beauties. Are you counting them? Mary Ann, Betty, Martha, Judy, Janice, John Edward, and Jojo. Seven is right. A wonderful American family. The mother of this happy brood had been unable to speak or hear since she was a child of six. Now, she is recovering her speech and hearing. Miraculous? Not at all. For good health and wholeness go hand in hand through life. So sing out with joy, for it is children like yourselves who may hold the key to the health of future generations. In Dalton City, Illinois, Robert Rowe lives on a farm with his good wife, Barbara, and their three fine husky boys, Jack, Ronnie, and Larry. Not so long ago, despite the fact that he was an organic farmer, Robert Rowe was a sick man, suffering constant pain in his back and shoulders. Searching everywhere for help, he was led to the study of a system called natural hygiene, which really is synonymous with normal living. It teaches that there is only one way to get well and stay well, and that is to discard all abnormal habits and to live normally thereafter. It teaches that each bad habit which we retain will retard our health. We cannot bargain with nature. It teaches that we should not eat our animal friends, but that we should share the joy of life together. That we should breathe pure air. That we should drink pure, unpolluted water. That we should get lots of sunshine and outdoor exercise, alternated with rest. That we should eat fresh food in simple combinations. It teaches that we do not live by bread alone, but that life goes on because of the symbiotic relationship between all of life. It teaches that food should be grown as naturally as possible. You may rest assured that no leaves are burned on this farm. Bob Rowe says that in his own case, he began to think of how enlightened farmers have overcome disease in plant life. In planting a tree, for example, the great teachers of organic culture came to the realization that nature has built up her forest floor through countless generations. And if we want to raise fruit and vegetables that will resist insects and disease, we must take great pains to try to imitate nature.
Similar open-minded methods of research and techniques might with great profit be applied to human life. On the day we visited here, luncheon was served to a group of friends fresh from unsprayed orchards. And there was no problem of serving them because they all knew that fresh fruit is a wonderful meal and not, as much of the world thinks, merely a dessert or an in-between snack. And afterwards, while the children played, we listened to a talk by Joy Jacaruso. She is in her early 30s, has three children, and her day begins by bouncing out of bed full of the joy of life. She says, when I was a child, I went the rounds of skin specials, but to no avail. I know now that it was the body's effort to cleanse my system. We all have a choice in life, and I try to choose the best for my family. How true are the words of the Bible, every herb bearing seed, and every tree which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. Of course, our children do pick up some bad habits on the outside, but it also works the other way around. It is not unusual for them to ask their mothers for the same kind of lunch that I pack for Lois and David, who go to school. The average housewife is constantly beguiled by plans and devices for making life easier. Civilized life is not easy or simple, but our obedience to the laws of life frees us from the slavery of the kitchen and gives us good health with the naturally greater power to cope with and surmount the most difficult problems. Miami, the city of sunshine and coconut palms. And where there are coconuts, there are monkeys. But the little one whom we want to meet here is the youngest of the Curcio family, Bunny. Her father, Christopher John Curcio, was away on a lecture tour when we visited there, but his wife, Jay, told of how this family's experiment in normal living began originally in the city of Rochester, New York, with Buddy, who is now 21. And then came Queenie, who at 17 has the average teenager's problems with her homework. And Bruce, who might be getting a bit hungry and who knows where good food comes from. Breakfast with this family is a couple of tall glasses of freshly squeezed orange juice. Here's to your health. As with other families whom we have seen, regardless of whether they live in the city or in the country, in a cold or in a warm climate, the foods that they select are the best from nature's garden. vitamins and minerals and all the body's needs are supplied abundantly by whole, fresh food. And we see how fallacious is the idea that man must eat gross, artificial and heavily concentrated foods to build strength. And now you know why we call Bunny a little monkey. Over 90% of children in presumably well-fed America have cavities but we found none amongst hygienically raised children. Bunny had a broken tooth, but you may be sure that she will wind up with a fine set of teeth and good health. For whether it is these four, or 400, or 4,000, or 4 million, good health will spread protective wings over all children everywhere, building strong disease-resistant bodies, providing they're given their normal needs. As we travel on to the summertime and autumn of our lives, is it still possible to enjoy the best of health? We will continue our search for the causes of health presently. But first, let us see how Sheldon and Rose have reacted to all this information. They were at our home on Thanksgiving Day, and while Sheldon asked many questions and I was trying to give him the answers, my wife, Sylvia, was busy in the kitchen giving some practical information to Rose on how to serve a company dinner without meat or the conventional fixings. Salad greens are washed thoroughly and wrapped in towels and stored in the refrigerator. The leafy greens should always be torn, not cut.
Things like celery, tomatoes, cucumbers, and green peppers should be cut in wide strips and always with the grain. What a delight to serve a meal for which no creature had to die. Let's pray in the immortal words of the poet Shelley. Never again may blood of bird or beast stain with its venomous stream a human feast. Sheldon and Rose were learning that it was lots of fun doing what comes naturally. Instead of turkey, we had baked acorn squash, eggplant and lightly steamed broccoli, beets and peas. Everything was fresh, of course, and we wish you were there to share this meal of Thanksgiving with us. Life itself is indeed the best school, and Rose and Sheldon now knew that if they wanted better health, they would have to discipline themselves. And as they discarded their old bad habits, they also did some thorough house cleaning. It may appear that they were preparing for a party, what with the liquor, candy, and cookies. And it really was a farewell party. No more would foodless foods disgrace this table. No more would they depend upon so-called food supplements, vitamins, or pills, or capsules. For once, sugar and coffee do go well together. Let the dead past bury its dead. And welcome instead to the glorious food on which mankind has survived through the ages. Food cooked by nature to a delicious turn of ripeness, uncontaminated and consumed in its wholeness. Food that gladdens man's eyes and that delights his senses of smell and taste and touch. In a few months, Sheldon lost 60 pounds. Before becoming interested in a more normal way of life, he had not read a book since he graduated from high school. But now he had to do a little carpentry to make room for his growing library. And besides the loss of weight, his colitis was gone. His itching psoriasis had practically disappeared. There were no more aches and pains. And although they still did not dare to hope that they might have a child of their own, they were spending much of their time in study and were encouraged by such true stories as Jack and Rose Solomons, who live in West Palm Beach, Florida. When they were both nearing the 40-year mark, having been told that they could not have a child of their own, they adopted a son in Cuba, who was away at school when we visited them. At a time when most people are approaching middle age, they changed their conventional habits of life completely. And lo and behold, these two children were born to them. At a convention party, Mr. and Mrs. C.E. Doolin of Dallas, Texas, told us that after three years of childless marriage, she finally began to follow the teachings of natural hygiene to try to avoid a dreadfully feared operation for possible cancer of the breast. She fasted for 36 days under proper supervision, and subsequently the growth disappeared completely. Now they have four children, two beautiful girls and two fine boys. Instead of a drastic operation with its ugly disfigurement and uncertain aftermath, Mrs. Doolin regained her health and used her knowledge to raise a happy family. Bertie Rausch of Brighton Beach, New York, is proud of the fact that at 55, she is youthful and enjoys radiant health. She has two children, Marion and Martin. Long ago, after 12 years of marriage, she was in poor health and was told that she could never bear a child. In 1938, she fasted for 38 days, improved her habits of living, and not only fully recovered her health, but to her great joy gave birth to a son. In addition to these stories of the conquest of sterility, we found many other examples of recovery and continued good health. In Detroit, Michigan, R.J. Cheatham had this tale to tell. On July 30th, 1948, I was released from a hospital following an operation for a condition diagnosed as malignant melanoma. Five years was my maximum life expectancy. Not wanting to die, I tried every treatment recommended to me, including drugs and shots, vitamins, minerals, massage, vibration, x-rays, and colonics. Instead of getting better, my condition became worse. I am in good health now because I have followed the teaching exemplified by such great teachers 
as Herbert M. Shelton, whose books I have read from cover to cover. I owe my being alive today to natural hygiene. Oliver Hewsett of New York City is an engineer who knows that man succeeds in his marvelous structures because he copies natural law. His wife, Martha, was a victim of tuberculosis, had one lung collapse, and was advised to discontinue her studies and be reconciled to her invalidism. As a result of following this better way of life, however, Martha graduated from Columbia University, number one in her class. Bonnie McKissock of Newark, New Jersey, a registered nurse, with a record of over 30 years in the profession, fell a victim to arthritis and was so badly crippled that she had to be carried on a stretcher. Her case was pronounced incurable. As a last resort, she started a natural hygienic routine two years ago, beginning with a fast of 40 days. After only 10 days of fasting, there was a dramatic change. She arose from her bed and walked by herself and has continued her upward climb to vibrant and vigorous health. The ancients knew the value of fasting for purification. All animals fast when they're sick. Fasting is complete physiological rest with abstention from all foods but water. Lou Cress of Lodi, New Jersey had to stop working because of a complete physical breakdown. On the 19th day of a fast, he drinks that water as if he thought it was a beer commercial. Maybe water is the best thirst quencher after all. Try it sometime. Lou Cress recovered his health, and if he wants to go back into business, there is nothing to stop him now. Say hello to Jim Pape. What was his trouble? While skin diving, he lost the hearing of his left ear completely, and he had been stone deaf on one side for many months. What would you do about it? Jim has decided to fast until he can hear the ticking of his watch. He has eaten nothing for five days. Let's see what happens on the eighth day of his fast. Here is a striking example of the body's constant effort to strive towards perfection. Jim fully recovered his hearing, and incidentally, he is a striking example of the kind of health, physique, and strength one can build up and maintain on a normal living plan. And many other fine examples can be cited. People like Joe Reed, a television engineer of Brooklyn, New York, who at the age of 46 still enjoys a run of six miles or so daily. Or Muriel Wolfson, a young mother of Chicago, Illinois. Muriel obviously does not depend on cosmetics for that glow of health. Or a ballerina like Ann Limpert of Royalton, Ohio who was able to dance again after authorities had said her case was hopeless. Or a student of the healing arts like James McEachin of Escondido, California, and hotel manager Muriel Sherrard of Coral Gables, Florida, and William Esser, writer and teacher of Lake Worth, Florida, who all pointed out that we should depend upon nature first instead of using her as a last resort. Joseph Brenner of Newark, New Jersey, head of a large office furniture company, whom we found sitting at his famous $7,000 desk, says that he now knows the thrill of awakening each day with the feeling that life itself is the greatest adventure. Several years ago, as we could see from his portrait, Mr. Brenner was about 40 pounds heavier, looked robust, but he had lost his former youthful drive. Today, he and his wife, Ann, know the joy of exuberant health. And as a hard-headed business executive, he has been thoroughly sold on natural hygiene, which has a successful record since the year 1820, when Trawl and Jennings, who were medical doctors, and Graham, who was a minister, first began its teachings. He says that life began for him at 58, and that people who returned to the ways of natural hygiene have moved the prime of life forward by many years. And bearing out his contention, Homer Kentner of Rochester, New York, retired printing salesman at the age of 67, offers a toast to everlasting youth, with pure water, of course. And James Lopez, a philosopher of Corona, Long Island, at the age of 65, is establishing a connecting link in this school of life with the Spanish-speaking world. And Irving Barnett, active in the rug business in Los Angeles, California, 
who travels with a box lunch that the airlines might well copy. And gracious Deborah Dunkelman of Chicago, Illinois, spry and proud of her years, demonstrates the kind of food that keeps her young. Robert Anderson of Rhinebeck, New York, who is enjoying a romp with his daughter and grandchildren, is well over the three score and ten mark now. It is a fact that he was given up to die when he was 40 years old, but he's still very much alive. The golden years are fruitful and full of promise for people like Fanny Schaefer of Woodridge, New York. And the promise has been fulfilled for Ivan Marks of Buffalo, New York, who at the age of 82, happily again operates his own printing press, something he certainly had never expected to do 10 years ago when he fell a victim to heart trouble. And well, you may smile, Ivan Marks, for well, you know the precious and priceless gift of old age is good health. In the year 1915, Ted Port, a naturalist of New York City, had one of his kidneys removed and he was sent to a home for incurables with a certain knowledge that he would be dead within a few years. Today, 40 years later, he is not only in excellent health, but he has built himself a powerful, strong and vigorous body. Lin Yutang says that life should be a symphony and end in a crescendo of peace. Instead of being in their graves, instead of a bed of pain, instead of frightful caricatures of human beings, age can indeed be the most glorious part of life. Thomas Southard of Columbus, Ohio, was forced to sell out a profitable printing business when he was about 50 years old because he was told that he had a swollen heart and might drop dead at any moment. He retired and waited for death. But he learned about the natural hygienic way, and today at the age of 88, he has re-established himself in another business. Often walks 10 miles, and he and his wife are enjoying life together with their children and grandchildren. At the age of 85, Herward Carrington of Los Angeles, California, is a living legend. More than 50 years ago, he wrote some of the classic literature of natural hygiene. Today, the world talks about geriatrics and the science of gerontology and wonders how to preserve the health of our aging citizens. Science needs go no further, for here are the positive answers as to how to add more years to life and more life to the years. And John Maxwell of Vista, California has reached the splendid golden age of 95. All of these people who are living this noble experiment prove that the same laws govern us from infancy to old age and that we can live in the springtime of life all our lives. And as springtime bursts forth again in all its miraculous glory, the soil that had formerly been barren was now stirring with new life. And the home that was formerly such a lonesome place was preparing for a new visitor. And not only was new life stirring here, but a richer, more wholesome, and deeper understanding had come to this household. And out of the fullness of his heart, Sheldon wrote a letter. I wish that I could get the lump out of my throat so that I might find the words to tell you how much we appreciate what you've done for us. To be a father means more to me than anything else in the world. I only hope that all of the unhappy people who can't have children could learn what they can do to help themselves. And Rose and Sheldon now understood that the attainment of good health is not an end in itself, but a means to an end, the best means for enabling us to reach our goals in life. And they also realize that all of life is interdependent, not independent. And if man is to survive, he must join hands harmoniously with all of life with which he is related. And instead of fighting nature, he must embrace her beauty and wisdom. And so civilization and mother nature will go forward hand in hand. <laughs>